Good afternoon, everyone. Okay. Um, dear Dr. Abdul Wahab Zaid, Secretary General of the Khalifa International Award for Date Palm and Agriculture Innovation, distinguished guests from inside and outside the UAE, respected media representatives, we are delighted and honored to meet you today in the ninth scientific virtual lecture organized by the Khalifa International Award for Date Palm and Agriculture Innovation in its 2020 Scientific Knowledge Sharing Program. And now I would like to welcome the Award Secretary General, Dr. Abdul Wahab Zayed, to give his welcoming note. Dr. Zayed, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Ms. Sarah. Thank you. Good evening, dear respected excellency, distinguished guest, researcher, scientist, date palm growers and producers, dear colleague, Dr. Jose Romano Falero, I am very delighted to meet all of you today through this weekly virtual platform. And I'm honored to start the ninth scientific lecture, which comes under the directives of His Highness Sheikh Nahyan Mubarak An Nahyan, Minister of Tolerance and Coexistence, President of the Award Board of Trustees, and also within the Award's 2020 Activities and Events Program. We are very pleased to welcome Dr. Jose Romano Falero, the international expert specialized in red palm weevil from the Republic of India and one of the FAO's experts. We will be presenting today a scientific lecture entitled Red Palm Weevil, Past, Present, and Future. Wishing everyone a fruitful time and hoping to see you in our coming events and lectures. Thank you. Dr. Falero, the floor is yours. Thank you, sir. Uh, I am delighted and honored to be doing this presentation. I wish to profusely thank uh, uh, Khalifa International Professor Zaid and his colleagues at the Secretariat of Khalifa International Award for Date Palm and Agricultural Innovation. Uh, I'm extremely delighted to be with you in the next one hour or so. As mentioned by Professor Zaid, I will be uh, doing an overview on red palm weevil, uh, talking about the past in little, the present where we are, and vistas for the future. So, uh, can I start my presentation? Yes, please, doctor. Okay. Please share your screen. Okay. Can you see it? No, we can't see it until now. Just make sure you're clicking on the green button beneath, uh, underneath the screen. Dr. Falero, you have to enlarge the screen to see the icons on the bottom, there was a green one that says share screen. Yeah, I, I did the click on that, but uh, I it's don't know not, what happened. It's not coming out. Okay, I, I will, I will re, uh, rejoin. Uh, okay. Just in a second. Okay. Yeah, I clicked on the screen and here are my presentation. We still can't see it, doctor. Share. Yes, now I think it's opening. Yeah, we can see it yeah. now. 
Just enlarge okay. the screen you, from down. Yes. It's possible to presentation mode. Yes. Is yeah. it okay? Yes, perfect. Thank you so much. Sorry for this little inconvenience. And no. again, I'm delighted and honored to do this presentation, especially during the year of international plant health. Excellent opportunity to be with Khalifa International once again and uh, speak about red palm weevil, which is such an important pest uh, the world over. Uh, uh, red palm weevil is one of the cousins of the Rhynchophorus group. There are about 10 weevils, the Rhynchophorus weevils, world, worldwide in different regions of the world. But red palm weevil, Rhynchophorus feather genus, is probably the most notorious, followed by Rhynchophorus palmarum in South America uh, on oil palm. Its global spread has been tremendous. It has uh, captured almost all the ecological regions of the world, except the temperate cold region where you don't find red palm weevil. And the predictions are it will still spread further. We do not have red palm weevil, Rhynchophorus ferruginus in South America. It's absent as of today, but the predictions are if the quarantine regulations are not followed, it will appear there soon. The recent European Plant Protection Organization report shows that red palm weevil is in about 50 countries, 49 countries to be precise. The most recent being Bulgaria, Bosnia in Southeastern Europe, Bulgaria in the, in the Black Sea Basin, and Russia. Russia has come on board. You know, Russia was having this pest for quite a few years, but no one reported this. And uh, of late, in the last two years, it has been reported, and it moved to Abkhazia from, from Russia. There were some uh, other reports also like Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, they have withdrawn red palm weevil from their list. Australia has withdrawn. They have the cousins, Rhynchophorus vulneratus, but not Rhynchophorus ferruginus. Similarly, USA, 2010, there was a big report saying that red palm weevil is in the US. Everyone was wondering, but later in 2013, molecular studies, they revealed that no, we don't have uh, ferruginous, we have vulnerators. Red palm weevil, as you know, has invaded some of the most pretty, beautiful, pristine, ecologically heritage sites all over the world. From Al Hasa, where I spent quite a time of my life in Al Hasa working on red palm weevil, to Tangier in Morocco, another beautiful place, Elche, Spain, Siva in Egypt, where uh, Khalifa International has done so much of work in Siva. All these beautiful places red palm weevil has invaded in the last 15 to 20 years. The latest, as I told you, is, is Russia and the Black Sea Basin countries and Djibouti in East Africa, 2018 report coming out of Djibouti. As the country range expanded, the host range also expanded. In the 19, uh, 50, in 1956, mid-1950s, you had just four palms, coconut palm, phoenix dactylifera, date palm, metrolux and sagu, and caryophyll, I'm really fair, fair, fair. Just these four palms were the host of red palm weevil. But today, it is reported on 40 palm species worldwide. So if anyone is importing any palm, please be careful. Do a proper quarantine uh, audit. Before you, before you really want to import something or export something to another country, a palm. Which are the top three palm species preferred? Phoenix canariensis, much preferred. Followed by Phoenix dactylifera, date palm, and coconut, where it was traditionally existing for so many years. Right through the Middle East and the Arab world, you see a date palm uh, grown profusely in monoculture settings. And this is particularly true in the last 20 years or so, rapid expansion of date palm. So red palm weevil on date palm attacks young palms less than 20 years. And estimates suggest that there are 50 million palms in the susceptible age group in the Nina region. This is a huge challenge for the countries. 
and and uh, for everyone alike to you know combat this pest and deal with it. Check export, export, escape routes of RPW. We have quarantine regulation. Each country has very good quarantine regulations, but probably when it comes to implementation, we are we we, we lag behind. We lack some countries lack proper quarantine pro protocols. This is a truck moving from one country into another country in the GCC region, carrying date palms. And whenever there is a big event, Sochi Olympics, Russia, 2014, they, they brought in uh, they, uh, Phoenix Canarienses, they brought in red palm beaver. Similarly, any big event happening, uh, the World Cup, now in Qatar has the World Cup, they have gone in for large landscaping. I was fortunate to visit Qatar a couple of years ago. The moment I got out of the airport, uh, the old airport, I saw Phoenix Canarienses. So I was wondering, when you have date palm, why do you need Phoenix Canarienses? No, it's a fascination for palms, to bring exotic palms. But when we bring exotic palms, we are bringing red palm babel with it. Then the offshoots. Offshoots are moving indiscriminately. Weak enforcement. The rules are there, regulations are there, but enforcement is very weak. The EU, European Union, has some, some uh, well-defined guidelines. They look at delimination of the area, survey and demarcate the areas, three monthly official inspection, annual crop, crop declaration, application for of phytosanitary treatments in the nurseries, in the hotspots, registration of planting material for movement, and use of plant passports to monitor the trade. These are broad guidelines. Each country could develop their own guidelines. This comes from Egypt. You see this field here is a field with a tractor and there is nothing, nothing there. You can see some palms probably if you look carefully about a kilometer or two kilometers away and you see red palm we will hear. From where this pest has come? How did it come? Who brought it there? You know, we don't understand the ecology and behavior of this pest. So that is the major reason why why, why um, uh, we are not able to control it very well. It is totally hidden. All the life stages are inside. The only life stage that flies out is the adult, partially, partially hidden, partially flying. And when it flies out, we deal with it with insecticide, we want to spray, or we want to trap it. These are the two, two logical things that we do. It's highly aggregated. Its behavior, one of the behavior is, if I have a heavily infested garden, my neighbor will get the infestation. It moves in groups, in, in clusters, one cluster to another cluster. This is in Tunis, in Tunisia. The national park there, right in Tunis, you see the headless palms of Phoenix Canariensis, all aggregated in nature, clumped. The seasonal behavior. During the summer, you get two peaks, one during March, April, May, and the other during November. But the November peak is better because the larvae are caught in the winter. They do not, the eggs are caught in the winter. They do not hatch. But these, these uh, adults that lay eggs, they result in infestation. There are several predisposing factors from neglected garden to uh, uh, trimming of the of the fronds, removal of offshoots. When we remove offshoots, when we trim the, uh, this, we create wounds. So they instantly attract the pest. And if we do not treat the wounds, um, uh, eggs are laid. Now, it, this is not always that it will lay eggs only on wounds. It will lay eggs in any hidden sites in the, in the offshoots. This is a Cut male palm. We often cut male palms and leave that like that. This becomes a breeding site. If we could just pour a little diesel in this, this would help. This is a closed garden, right? In the GC, in all most of the GCC countries, you will face this closed garden problem. Many of the gardens are closed. Now, some of the countries have come up with regulations. They, they put a notice on your board. If Bob Sakkar, they say, okay. We will cut your electricity and we'll cut your water if you don't report within a week. So the door will open automatically after a week, the door will open if someone is inside. Then, see, this is Saudi Arabia, you know, flood irrigation. 
flood irrigation for date palm it it is it is not very good when especially when the water touches the stem it attracts red palm weevil now damage and detection and ip we have to know the damage symptoms these are the damage symptoms you see the juice coming out from cut fronds if these were cut and they were not treated you see white aerial offshoots from far away this is 100% red palm weevil if you go in the base you will find red palm weevil this is the frond very difficult to detect these symptoms are not enough you have to have an experience to detect an infestation this is of no use this is anyone will say this is infested this is in portugal in lisbon this is right here in goa in my state in coconut and this is in saudi arabia date palm coconut phoenix canary and such these are these are gone cases this has to be removed so these are the early symptoms but very difficult to get them in phoenix canary and such you have a you have a series of symptoms just the first three stages perforated fronds chewed fronds and frond wilting if you catch it at this stage you may be able to save the palm once asymmetry starts crown asymmetry partially collapsed crown no new fronds umbrella stage this is the end there you cannot recover such palms 1 2 3 symptom number 1 symptom number 2 symptom number 3 if you are in symptom number 4 your task is difficult symptom number 5 you might as well cut the palm and take it home or eradicate so so early detection is the is the key to the success of red palm we will control this is in italy where all this is umbrella stage this this is of no use or so much of devastation now here comes the loss what is the loss there is no figure put on the loss as such but it runs into millions of dollars each country when we see country reports they say the losses are enormous they have not quantified none of the countries have sort of done a study on the economics but it runs into millions of dollars of the loss itself and then the control measures are also very expensive to replace these palms now it's also an expensive affair so what is the ipm strategy the ipm strategy this has been uh, this was published by fao and it is it is divided into four stages stage 1 stage 2 stage 3 stage 4 stage 1 is day to day operations if you are in operations doing area wide control you will be dealing with stage 1 stage 2 the government will come in quarantine regulations quarantine protocols they will the government plays a role stage 3 is supportive you will support the ipm above stage 4 training workshops ipm field days extension all supporting the program so stage 1 the moment you have red palm weevil you will either go for detection you will go for detection or trapping in in any order you may start trapping first or you may start manual visual detection chemical treatments both curative and preventive removal of severely infested palms and then validation many of the countries don't do validation properly validation is lacking there some ipm program is going on some traps are there some uh, insecticide is being sprayed uh, eradication or removal of severely infested palms is happening but no people you know sort of don't sit back and 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 analyze data because huge quantity of data is released in area wide operations so this is in day to day operations and and one has to give a very clear thought about the operations we will i will show you um, exemplary cases of uh, the canary islands where they use gis and things like that to do proper validation of the program um, uh, people talk about resistance host palm resistance you know date palm has a wonderful genetic diversity uh, reports say there there could be as many as 5000 species 5000 varieties a beautiful genetic diversity but none of it is so far exploited for control of red palm we will per se the varieties that we like red palm we will also likes you you want class in the gcc countries red palm we will is highly susceptible to, class is highly susceptible to red palm we will you go for sukari red palm we will like sukari you go for uh, maybe deglatnur in in north africa red palm we will would like uh, deglatnur so uh, resistance is to be exploited 
Frond and offshoot management is of very great importance. When you remove the fronds and remove the offshoots, please treat the sites. Water, excessive flooding, this is not to be done. Palm density, you know, irregular spacing. We, we try to overplant. We try to overplant. This is not very good. Poor field sanitation. These are some of the predisposing factors. Now, when it comes to detection, there are many detecting aids that are being researched upon, but most of it is being done is visual. Today we have detecting of chemical signatures. There are papers to say, you know, chemical signatures of red palm weevil can be detected. Acoustic detection, sound detection is most uh, advanced. From uh, Mankin in, 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 in Saudi Arabia to cast Hassan al in, in Saudi Arabia, uh, acoustic detection is moving ahead. So probably we'll get a good acoustic detector. Optic fiber detection, basically principle is acoustic detection, infrared cameras, thermal imaging, very costly things, you know, very costly. So detection, when it, a good detection device should be efficient, should be easy to use, and should be low cost, of low cost. These are some of the detectors. This is a sound detecting device. Dogs are being used. I know of one farm in, in, in Saudi Arabia that has used dogs very effectively. Abdul Latif Jamil. Huge plantation in Saudi Arabia, Al Ghasim. They are using dogs and visual infestation. This sensor-based detection, this was from Egypt, but did not work. This is some other type of detector, but really did not take off. This is the recent AgriNet uh, detector, but it's cloud-based. You know, their information is put to the cloud. They put a bismar, a nail in every, every palm. Doesn't look to be very practical and could be very costly and, you know, interpretation. Who will interpret this? You will have to hire someone to interpret this data. The farmer should be able to interpret it. That's the time that the detector will be useful. So, here, this is Saudi Arabia. The engineer going with a screwdriver, visual, uh, visual detection. Very experienced engineer, he will be able to detect uh, infestation. This is in the Canary Islands, visual detection. So visual detection is the one that is, uh, that is uh, practiced widely. And here, I was fortunate in Saudi Arabia during the FAO program, uh, you know, we could, uh, we were testing repellents and suddenly there was a report that, you know, the infestation is very high. So we stopped our repellent work and the infestation was 7%, 250, uh, 80 palms infested in a garden of 30 hectares. Out of 3,000 palms, 270 infested. Within a month, the mudriya brought it down to 1% just by visual inspection. And then every month they kept checking, 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 checking. And within a year, less than a year, they brought it to almost negligible. But I have put a danger sign here. This is the inoculation that will take off again if we do not, if we do not look at this. So visual inspection once a month, or once in 45 days we say now, Saudi Arabia is practicing it. It's, it's very good. Next is trapping. Uh, you know, the most common thing we say is uh, put one uh, trap. Uh, trapping is the first thing we want to do. Um, uh, and these traps, they have the pheromone and the host attractants. Now this trap can be a double-edged sword. If you don't follow the right protocols, the, uh, the insect can go on the tree. What, what is the history of trapping? These are the traps, these are the lures, this is the food bait, ethyl acetate, trap density. Uh, you know, there are papers to say you put 10 traps per hectare, but is it possible to put 10 traps per hectare? Operationally, it is not. If you are doing operations as a farm manager, you cannot put 10 traps per hectare. No one can. So you go with one trap per hectare and then go for dry trapping systems, especially in these COVID times. What is, the, what is the, when the labor cannot be accessed, labor doesn't go to the field, social distancing, the best thing would be is to have your trap and go for bait-free trapping. You have now in the UAE this elect trap, which you don't have to service. This is also very good. But the ultimate trap would be one that is smart, that is giving you data and that does not need servicing. People are working on this type of a trap. Trapping just accounts for about 40% of the population. The remaining population is there. This was an olfactometer study we did at King Faisal in Saudi Arabia. 
and that, they, they we saw that uh, just about 35 to 40 percent comes to the traps the remaining doesn't so that's why trapping itself will not help this is in libya fao mission 2010 in in uh, tabruk you see they did only trapping and nothing else they had 10 weevils per trap per month and this reached up to 100 weevils per trap per month in May 2009 into February 2010. Within seven months, they got 10 times increase in the capture. That's because they were doing nothing else, only trapping. Whereas uh, Morocco was combining trapping with uh, detecting, with treating, with eradicating, and their trap captures remained at two to five evils per trap per month. They could not eradicate it, but they suppressed it. How many traps you put? Wherever we go, they ask how many traps we put. We start with one trap per hectare, and if the density increases, you increase the traps. Trapping is population dependent. So if, you, if the population is high, you go for higher trapping. But higher trapping is not practical. And therefore, this is, a, this is what happens. If you put more traps, you can't service them. So this will be counterproductive. This is very bad. The moment you see Dubab flies in your trap, you know this trap is not serviced for at least a month. So what do you do? You go for serviceless trapping options, which is attract and kill, dry traps, and repellents. Repellents is not very well developed, but I'll come to it. This is a dry trap uh, that originated from Italy and uh, has its base in the UAE. And it's quite good. I saw it in Jordan. We saw it in uh, Saudi Arabia. We tested it. It's quite good. It does not need servicing. It's a dry trap. Now, the principles on which it's working, the company claims it is electromagnetic radiation. But uh, there is a group in uh, the Costa Rican group has said, no, it is that it does not prevent escapes. It prevents escapes. So that's why it's working. This is the study we did in Saudi Arabia. The, 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 uh, these traps, the standard uh, Saudi trap and the Pikusan trap, they need servicing. Whereas the no servicing, the elect trap is a dry trap, no servicing. So your people did not go to the field to, to record observations. Once a month, yes. Ultimate trap, as I just mentioned, would be with one that is smart. Cast is working, it, working on it in Saudi Arabia. And through the uh, coming FAO project, they plan to take it further. They make it smart. They make the dry trap smart. You get data through satellite directly on your laptop. Early morning, you come, you open your laptop, you know, OK, there is a red palm we will in Abu Dhabi, this place. There is Red Palm, we will Abu Dhabi, that place. Trap number 10, trap number five, okay. But we have to use this data. Having data on the laptop or in our book will not be enough. This is dry trapping. You just put a stop, a spot. This cannot be put on one, one tree. It has to be put on all the trees. So the question asked is, there are millions of palms. Do you put on all the million palms? No. You put only where the infestation is high, in neglected gardens, where you cannot go. This was another dry trapping system, but it does not, is not very efficient. So we deleted it. This spot you see, this is the spot you leave on the tree. There are two, uh, two companies that make this. One is Smart Ferrol Ferrolure and one is Hook W. One is USA, one is Costa Rica. Both are equally effective. I tested it even here in India. This was in Al Ghazi, where you had dead weevils on the ground. But the, 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 the ministry wanted evidence. So when it came to evidence, we put the spots in containers. I call them containers, not traps. At 5% of the points. 5% of the points in four months, 24 weeks, captured 111 weevils. This is in al Khat in six hectares. So yes, in this garden, you require attract and kill. You require to increase the trapping density. Whereas in the garden B, farm B, it captured only seven weevils. 5% points captured seven weevils. So it does not make economic sense to use attract and kill here. So attract and kill has to be used selectively and based on your trap data, based on your infestation data, you, you go in for attract and kill. And I would re-emphasize, COVID times, this is an excellent tool to use in the field. Sometimes due to the private, uh, private contractors, they are unable to service the traps because they don't get laborers or their orders are not issued. Just do attract and kill. It will work. Where do you do it? In neglected plantations, in mazras that you cannot enter. 
This is in Mauritania, FAO project in Mauritania. We used attract and kill there as one of the components. It worked wonderfully. Repellents. You use repellents to push the insect away and give protection, especially in organic garden. We identified a group of repellents and in the FAO project, we tested it for palm protection, but the data was inconclusive. We need to repeat the data, repeat the trial. This is the theory. You put repellents in the center and traps on the border. So push-pull, you develop a push-pull strategy. But you have to put numbers on this. This is a theory. There are no numbers, there's no paper. This has to be worked out. Chemical treatments. Are we spraying too much? Are we? So much of insecticide is being used. Are preventive sprays really required? Preventive, you can, you can manage your garden without preventive sprays, I believe. Now, this is in Phoenix Canariensis, where they put a tube and allow insecticide right on the top. In Phoenix Canariensis, probably it is okay because the infestation is on the crown. But in date palm, so much of spraying is probably not required. This is when you remove the offshoots and the fronds. Yes, this is the time you require spraying. This is in the Canary Islands, where they have to spray the crown, periodically spray the crown. Very expensive, very laborious. Which are the insecticides? These are the range of insecticides. You have a group of insecticides, better to rotate the insecticides in different treatments for the crown, for the front treatment, or for a soil drain. This is curative treatment of an infested palm. You drill and push insecticide in. Very in a simple way. This was in Egypt where they made holes, the farmer made holes, and through a can he delivered insecticide. It by diffused inside and it got controlled perfectly well. Now, here in some places they remove the tissue excessively. This is more the damage than what the red palm women did. In some countries, they damage the tissue due to excess pressure during palm injectors, using palm injectors. Are these palm injectors really required? I saw in Egypt where the frond has died. This is the frond here. It has died due to excess pressure. So uh, using a pressure machine has to be very, very uh, done very carefully. Should not exceed two bar. You can recover palms that are in the early stage of attack. This is in Tunis, where the Canary Island palm, you see the sprout coming again. Izala, removing the palms, eradicating the palms. This is another big, laborious, expensive uh, process. Pulverizers, uh, taking the palm to another site. But now what FAO is saying, if you open FAO guidelines, it is clearly written there that you only eradicate the infested part. The other part, you keep it there. Don't take it anywhere. Just let it be there. You cut your cost and you do justice to the whole program. Burning, this is this 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 burning also is not recommended because you inside it remains as it is. And the moment you cut the palm, you have to pour some insecticide. So what is being said now, what FAO recommends is you, you remove only the part that is infested. The remaining part, let it be there. No need of removing the whole palm. When you remove and transport the palm, be very careful. I'm showing it for, uh, for, for uh, canary ansies, but this principle also is true for date palm, where you have to shift the infested portion to another side. You have to fully enclose it and shift it. If you're going to take it open, you will have insects flying out and, re and infesting your gardens on the way. Biological control, much spoken of. Every seminar we meet, they talk of biological control. Practically, uh, this is difficult to, to, to exploit in the field. But now in the FAO program on uh, research, this, this is being given priority. There were two good papers on semi-field uh, semi assays saying that nematode and Bavuria bassiana formulations work to some extent in the field, semi-field assays. Periodic validation, here you are. You did everything, you did trapping, you did detection, you did uh, curative treatment, preventive treatment. Do you validate your program? You sit every week with your engineers or every month or every 15 days and validate. For validation, you need a map. You need to know where, what, where you are. 
This was a map in 1997, a simple when there was no GIS, no nothing. This was a hand-drawn map. Every day we used to plot the trap captures on the on the map. And end of the month we would get a beautiful diagram. You don't have to, you know, say I don't have GIS, I don't have GPS. You sit with a map. You make a map of your own. Hand draw a map and plot the plot the trap captures on it every week. And this will give you a beautiful map. Your manager will know. Your supervisors will know where you are working. What is the situation? You can divert your resources from one place to another. This is 300 hectares, mind you, all Suhemia. 30,000 farms, about 270 hectares, 1997, before GPS came. Then, you know, in the Canary Islands, they started using GPS, data collection, transmission, interpretation, decision making. This formed the core of their control program and it gave quite good results. They developed an effective mobile application. Now, FAO has developed a mobile application called Susa Hamra, which is, which is used for data collection, transmission, and interpretation. This was a plain GIS map of the trap captures during spring, during summer. During spring 2009, they, this area was bad as compared to 2010. But in the summer, there was an improvement, more yellow. And if you see annually, the, 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 the 2009 looked better than 2010. So this is for project managers or even for supervisors to see where they are, when they need to divert their resources, need to divert their funds to the areas or the hotspots where it is most required. FAO is developing a Susa Hamra mobile application where uh, they are planning a regional, a regional uh, collaboration. A data a platform, a uni unified platform will be available where data will be transmitted through Susa Hamra mobile application for infestation, for trap captures, these are the two major parameters. And of course, other parameters like uh, curative treatments, removals of palms, etc. Success stories. Success stories coming of the Canary Islands and Mauritania. What did they do? Canary Island did delimination, inspection, intensive guided inspection, eradication of infested palms. They did not treat any infested palms. They did trapping, they did cultural practices, they did legislation, they did not allow, it was an island situation, so probably a bit easy. They did not allow any imports into the island. Continuous training, awareness and extension, risk evaluation. This is where you have to sit down with your team as a manager and evaluate. Control the movement of planting material even within the island. The manager was telling us that once the municipality wanted to plant uh, plants, uh, palms, you know, there is a clash between the municipality and the, and the directorate of agriculture. Municipality wants to do uh, beautification and brings palms, infested palms and plants. So there has to be a cooperation between the municipality and the, and the uh, directorate of agriculture. And they use GIS. What did, the, what did it be doing in Mauritania? Inspection, of course, Mauritania was a very small area, but in, infestation starts in everywhere in small, small proportion. They did inspection, they did trapping and attract and kill, eradication of all infested palms. They did not treat any palm. Strict quarantine measures. Treatment of wounds. Any wound after removing the front, they treated it. Prohibited offshoot removal. For some time, the farmers cooperated and they said, we will not remove the offshoots. For a year, they did it. They went on intensive training, participation of the farmers in the program. This is probably lacking in the GCC countries. Farmers don't participate in the GCC. The, the, state, the state provides everything. Proactive extension farming, extension campaign. These were some of the major parameters that helped Mauritania gain full control or eradicate red palm weevil. May 2020, they were supposed to declare that they have eradicated red palm weevil. Now, the UN had a high-level meeting in 2017 in Rome. Several countries, several organizations, NGOs, scientists, private sector participated, reaffirmed their commitment to lead national, regional, and global efforts to combat red palm weevil. The meeting agreed on a framework strategy for eradication of red palm weevil and supported the establishment of a trust fund to implement the strategy, which is currently being implemented from the Nina, from the from Egypt, uh, regional headquarters in Cairo. So 
two programs basically one one for the nina region where you have the key out, outputs of governance monitoring scientific research this is being developed now by fao capacity building and coordination and the global platform for data data uh, data collection georeference data monitoring early warning systems mobile app for data collection online system and data analysis so huge data is released every day in red palm we will area wide control programs so the susa hamra app so what are our next priorities as far as research is going to be early detection tools efficient should be efficient easy to use cost effective quarantine protocols we do not have quarantine protocols for landscape farms and even for uh, for the for the uh, offshoots we need easy uh, quarantine protocols dipping in insecticide and all becomes very cumbersome biological control there are good biological control agents but delivery and sustenance this is a problem new semio chemical mediated technologies like push pull involving repellents and attractants attract and kill that we just discussed attract and infect biological control you attract it in the trap and infect it with a bacteria or nematodes and let it go and infect the other population understanding the bioecology of the pest impact of preventive insecticide applications i would uh, you know like to emphasize we are over depending on insecticides and our dates especially from the nina region should not get a bad reputation of excessive use of insecticide because you know these are very harmful then using molecular techniques for actual practical control there are huge number of papers advanced uh, high uh, peer peer reviewed journals but they just remain in the journal there is nothing much that is delivered in the field as far as molecular biology goes today so uh, this is all i have to say and uh, i hope uh, i was uh, effective in uh, conveying the message i wish to thank uh, fao uh, the organizations that i worked in the past the environment ministry of environment water and agriculture kingdom of saudi arabia king faisal university in alassa and the indian council of agricultural research over the last 20 30 years i have been involved with this organization thank you very much thank you so much dr valerio uh now we can welcome any questions um to dr valerio if any of the participants does anyone have any questions please raise your electronic hand so we can I tried but it didn't work can i have can i ask question Yes, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Falero, for this uh, very interesting and also very technical presentation. Uh, as you know, we work together in Saudi Arabia with our colleague yeah. Dr. Abdullah bin Abdullah. How we've been in, involved in this program and uh, through the project we've been implementing in Saudi Arabia. and also there are so many projects and programs implemented around the world <clears throat> you you here you talked mostly about the technical issues but as, as someone as an expert who is involved in this issue of red palm weevil for for years or uh, I, i have a question and i would like to know how do you evaluate the uh, how do you evaluate the ipm programs implemented by different countries international organizations to control red palm weevil we've seen so many strategies so many conferences technical meetings etc but still the pest is spreading and the situation is worse the sanitary situation is worse this is one the second i've seen that you are talking about the bovier the, the bovaria bassiana is then again coming in and as you know this have been the subject bovaria nematodes etc this have been the subject of a large regional program in the gulf area implemented by AOE, aoid AOED. and financed by triple id i personally participated with dr zaid and other colleagues in al ain for to discuss the outcome of this program and we've seen that at the at the end we came out that it didn't help because people they were working in laboratories they were yeah. putting their fungi 
in uh, uh, optimal situations and then yeah. it was it was normal that it killed and then it infected the, the pest but in the field issues are mm -hmm. different you know and the in the when working in the laboratory you put it in, in 25 degrees with 90 percent humidity etc while in the field you are at 45 50 mm -hmm. degrees 30 percent of humidity etc mm -hmm. then it's very dry it's not then it didn't work in the field this, I, I'm, I'm really surprised that, that we are coming back to it. And also just to find the last thing is about the success stories. The stories or success stories you listed, as you said yourself, this is in very limited area. In uh, Canary Island is also isolated areas. But yeah. these issues, these programs and all this, what we have used, we've been in Saudi Arabia and you saw the, Saudi Arabia that has used huge uh, materials, equipment, and uh, etc. Still, the situation is something like this. It will never work. For example, in 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 in, in Al Hasa, where you have two million big parts. Thank you. Uh, uh, regarding evaluation. Evaluation of the program, uh, Dr. Haibi, uh, two criteria that, that can be used vigorously to evaluate. One is the trap capture, provided the traps are good. Now, if you have a bad trap, you will not get any, any susa, you will not get any insect, and you will say, My program is good. I've seen in some countries, I won't name the country, they said, You know, our trap captures are coming down. So, so when we when we saw the 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 pheromone they were using, they had changed the pheromone. They were evaluating against a weaker pheromone, so they were getting lower catches. So under a standard protocol, you have to evaluate your program. This is number one. Second is infestation reports also help. But what we see is infestation reports. Some of the engineers go and come back and say everything is okay. There is no problem. There's nothing in the field. One fine day, the whole tree falls down. So infestation reports are, are a bit dicey to, to de repair, depend on. So if, if you have a good trapping program, this is the number one criteria to judge your whole, whole uh, program. Uh, on, a, on a broader scale, um, uh, over a period of time, how the captures have come down. This is the way to evaluate the, the whole program. And we have developed, uh, it was through the FAO program only during the first mission in 2008 with Dr. Ben Abdullah and all, a sequential sampling program, wherein we, we, we see um, in, in, a, in a sample size of 100, what is the infestation, whether it is 1% or less than 1%. That is a sequential sampling plan that can be used to assess your program. These are the basic criteria, and now you have GIS, things like that, which, which also help. Yeah. Uh, now we have Mr. Mustafa. I think he has a question for Dr. Uh, 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 yes, Sarah, may I also answer about biological control? I am in complete yes. agreement with Dr. Ohaibi. This biological control uh, is not that good. It doesn't work. And uh, the AOAD program and all has clearly shown that, that, that uh, it does not work. But we still see papers coming up about biological control off and on. So Dr. Ohaibi, I'm totally agreement with you about biological control. But what happened in Bari is some, some, uh, some uh, researchers said that it is very effective and it works very well. So, so then they said, okay, we give you a last chance. Let us, let us test it properly. We define a protocol and we we, 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 we say what are the parameters. Ikarda was supposed to lead this program, but uh, let's see how it goes. Once and for all, we want an answer, yes or no. Does biological control work or it does not work? Okay, Mr. Mustafa, I think you can go ahead now. Yes, thank you very much. This is uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Mustafa Echid from Morocco. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Falero, for this beautiful and uh, concise uh, presentation. Very, very interesting for us in Morocco since we, we had that problem some, since a few years ago and we really need to control it. 
Thank you very much also to Khalifa International for organizing such uh, very interesting conferences. My questions are in three parts. Uh, my first question is about the acoustic detection and any early detection. Could you please tell us, Dr. Falero, what is the best detection, uh, I mean, uh, early detection available today? Because as you know, in Morocco, it's still, the, the red palm wave is still on the north, which is to deal Thank with, uh, with canariensis. Yes. But imagine if this uh, yeah. if this uh, if this insect goes to the uh, to the uh, oasis in south, that yes. would be terrible for us. Disaster. So I would like to know if if you can tell us in a very concise way what is the best one available you, uh, today. That's the first question. Uh, as Let of me... now, Dr. Mustafa, there is no really very very uh, you know effective. See, I, I believe that uh, that the principles of a good detector is efficiency number one yes ease of use tomorrow you say i have a detector where it is transmitting data to the cloud and the cloud will send data to to your laptop and all these things and you need to hire someone to interpret the data this is not a detection system i i, I don't believe in this it's, the detector has to be in your hand so the visual so, one, visual one is today is the best thing. Is the visual, the visual one. is the only one that is working practically. But there are groups that are working on this hand detector, acoustic detectors that can be used with the hand. So so and it may come very soon. It may come. You give it about a year or so. I think we will have something something from Riyadh or Cast. There something may come. But where you say, you know, IoT, inter, what is that, Internet of Things and all this uh, cloud-based, yes. and you, uh, th this is a very difficult uh, issue. As it is, a uh, red palm we will control is complicated. We don't need to make it more complicated. Okay. Satellite, about... it comes by a satellite and all this uh, yeah. very high tech. Uh, this is uh, not practical. So visual is the only thing that will help. 45-day uh, cycle. We recommend a 45-day cycle. Saudi Arabia is implementing this visual observation. A bit costly, but effective if you have a good manpower. See that your manpower does not leave you. Yes. How about the smart traps? Since if we, if we, I mean, if you put, if we put enough smart traps together with visual uh, observations, are the are these smart traps actually effective today? Are they really working? And uh, Dr. what is the situation? Yeah, Doctor Mustafa, the smart trap uh, is is only it only transmits data. So so uh, the servicing part, see the elect trap is dry. Yes. It captures, it is dry. It is not smart. Yes. So if you make the dry trap smart, that is a real smart trap. So today is it, you have. Is it a, is it available in the market today? No, no, no. I have just read the reference last week, some Rinko Foss, Rinko Foss or someone in Spain, I can send you the reference, um, yes, that they have made the Picusan trap smart. Picusan trap, but the yes. Picusan trap needs, uh, needs to be serviced. Picusan trap needs food. So if you're going to put food, anyways, yes. so, so yeah, uh, you know, there is no real smart trap as such. The elect trap is quite good. But you have to have your normal trap also to get the data. Are you aware of that smart trap developed in Holland? I don't know where, where it- Maybe was. Holland, maybe Holland. Yeah, I will send you this reference. I, I don't remember it right now. They, they, it's commercially available and I will send you. But uh, when I read Picusan trap made smart, that is only half the story. Picusan yes, trap yes. needs servicing. Picusan yes. trap, you have to put food inside. Yes. So if you're going to put food, you might as well get the data every week. You don't Absolutely. need data every second. You're Absolutely. not going to run to your field. If you get data now, you're not going to run to your field. You can wait for a week. Okay. La last question, just to, to, to leave the floor for other people to, to, yeah. to intervene. Uh, about uh, endotherapy. I mean, I know you, 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 you don't like too much endotherapy, especially if, if it's a high pressure. It should be under two bars. But there are other systems used in Spain that looks quite good. What do you think about these systems? Yes, there are there are good systems. I agree, but um, it should be under technical supervision. Okay. If properly trained people can do it. It's very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and now we have Dr. Ashraf al uh, I think you have a question for Dr. Valerio. Yes. Uh, hello, everybody, and good evening for everybody. First of all, I'd thank you, Dr. Jose for a nice and very inform informative presentation. 
and many thanks for Khalifa International Order for this series of virtual presentation, which really benefit all of us. Uh, actually, my question to Dr. Jose about the biological control, because you know the red palm evil, it looks like we have to live with it. It is impossible to eradicate, to eliminate, and uh, to whatever we do, we do actually, we have to live with it. The biological control, I heard about uh, some article about using of bacillus, a very special kind of bacillus uh, for killing or for eradicating the, uh, the red palm weevil. Actually, this is used to put some of this organism bacteria as a bacteria antagonist. In some of the, uh, of, the, of the dead palm, actually, it helps a lot in eradicating some of these species in the early stage. Have you heard about it? And have you do some research about using of such bacillus bacteria as an antagonist against the red palm weevil? Per se, I have never worked on biological control. This is one component I have never worked on. And yeah. uh, there are reports about bacillus, you know, against red palm weevil coming from India way back. I think from Egypt also, there are reports about bacillus. But um, you see, doctor, uh, any technology uh, will just take off. If, if this thing is working, uh, I think it, it is a wonderful thing. We all want this. We want a biological, good biological control agent. Right from the time that, uh, you know, uh, we started our program in 1993, uh, the, someone came with tiger nematode from USA. This yeah. tiger nematode, when you put it in the tree with the susa, it will work. When you, uh, the moment the, the insect is deep inside a tree, it does not work. So it depends, you know, these papers, I tell you, these papers are sometimes deceptive. They, they pour the uh, they pour the bacillus on the on the on the insect they release inside yeah. and they all have died whether it is gone right inside inside the inside the meristem inside the xylem phloem whether that bacillus can reach that is to be seen i make a hole i put some uh, susa inside and i pour uh, bacillus it will die and then i come back and i write a paper the field work i tried in the field it has worked very well yeah <laughs> So uh, let us let us uh, give it some time. At least I have not heard of this bacillus thing. Thank you yeah. so much, Dr. Ashraf. Uh, now we would like to give the floor to Dr. Abdul Wahab Zayed, please. Thank you, Ms. Sarah. Uh, usually I keep my uh, brief uh, intervention at the end, but to make this uh, conference uh, more fruitful, well, first, let's thank Dr. Falero for his excellent presentation. I'm always uh, pleased with uh, his valuable input as an expert, but also as a lecturer and so on. So thank you again on behalf of Khalifa Award. Uh, I think to make it more fruitful, there are other, uh, we are lucky, of course, to have several, the best experts in the world in regard to different discipline we have I'm not going to cite everybody, but you have Dr. Abdul Basat, you have Dr. Wahabi, Dr. Abdullah bin Abdullah, Dr. So many people in different fields. But in this pest issue, uh, I am pleased to see, I hope he's uh, with us now, Dr. Al Buhsini. Uh, he used to be with ICARDA, and he worked a lot in the ICARDA program in the uh, GCC and other country in regard to the red palm weevil. So I want to, if uh, possible, Ms. Sarah, to give him a uh, few words. Also, we have Dr. Walid Kaka. He's also a pest control uh, expert and he, been, he did write several manuscripts and books in this regard. We do have also our dear Michel Ferry. I can see him, he's also connected. So if we could uh, ask kindly these people, uh, these uh, honorable experts to give us one or two minutes, uh, you know, uh, uh, about the subject so everybody will be beneficial. Uh, but again, I do highly second what has been said by uh, our dear colleague, Dr. Falero, in regard to uh, the best detection technique and eradication and so on, mostly to answer our dear friends, Dr. Mustafa Aichid. I have two countries that I leave the case with, is uh, Sultanate of Oman and Israel. Both of them have been infested and both of them 
control the situation by visual examinations and eradication. So that those two models should be well followed for every these modern plantations wherever they are. So the floor is Ms. Sarah, if, if possible, to Dr. Bohsini, Dr. Walid Kaka, and uh, Mr. Michel Ferry. Thank you. Thank you. So now um, we can welcome Dr. Bohsini, if you can hear us. Okay, I think now we can go with um, Dr. Abdullah bin Abdullah. I think you have a question first. Hello, hello. Hello, 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 hello Dr. Faleru. Thank you for this uh, presentation. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, see you again and to meet you through uh, our honorable uh, uh, award, Khalifa International Award. Uh, my just my question because I, I can see and we are afraid about the south of Tunisia for uh, for uh, for this red palm wheel. Uh, we are still struggling in the north to uh, to control this uh, this uh, this uh, insect. Um, I I think what what I know uh, and uh, through all what we work together in Saudi Arabia is uh, that the, uh, the, the important thing in this uh, fight against the uh, red palm wheel is the management. But unfortunately, this is the, really the, 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 weak, the weak, uh, uh, weak thing we have uh, uh, in, in all, uh, most of our countries to, to fight against the red palm wheel. I don't, I don't know, I, I just want to... Just to have your opinion about the control in Tunisia, if you are informed, of course. But I can tell you, it's still going uh, from uh, governorate to another in the north. Dr. Abdullah, uh, so nice to see you again. And um, this is a dangerous situation. When we met in Tunis two years ago, we had put up a proposal you know, on what should be done. And the great fear is of even your train, uh, train uh, that moves from Tunis to, to, the, to the south, that this insect could hitchhike on the, on the train and go, go to the south. So this is a possibility. And uh, for that, um, monitoring, monitoring to whatever extent possible, capacity building and quarantine. These are the three pillars where red palm weevil does not exist monitoring now the next question is whether we should put traps or should not put traps we have decided that you put traps in a particular season and remove them don't keep them there throughout and move the traps because you can get a wider area you can get a grasp of a wider area if that could be done phytosanitation phytosanitary treatments do not allow any planting material to move without certification this is the number one, number one uh, uh, requirement because a lot of nurseries are taking Phoenix canariensis and other palms from the north to the south to all the oases. This, is, this can create a problem. Uh, I would like to emphasize the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, success in Sudan. They have in, implemented, they don't uh, permit uh, transport of offshoot from one oasis to another. When uh, Dr. Zaid sent me there to Sudan, we, this is what we saw, which was, which was very nice. Uh, from one oasis to another, there is a mamnu, there's a ban on the transport of offshoots. So your offshoot, you use it in your oasis only. Don't take it from uh, south to another oasis, your relative living somewhere, no, this is all stopped. Nurseries have to be managed very well. Most of the uh, cities, have nurseries. I see it here in India. I see it everywhere. In all the countries, we were in Jordan, in Amman, so many nurseries, palm nurseries. So they are, they are also responsible for transmitting this, uh, this pest. And of course, capacity building for the farmers, for, to the uh, agriculture officers, to all the stakeholders. 
thank you so much. So uh, now we can uh, welcome Dr. Bohseni. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zaid, for and thank you so much for the uh, Khalifa Award for this opportunity. Of course, I'd, I'd like to thank my friend, uh, Dr. Filera, for the wonderful presentation he gave. Uh, as usually, he's, he's an excellent uh, speaker. I usually enjoy his uh, his uh, talks. And now, let me just uh, uh, comment on uh, the biological control aspect. Uh, of course, there were uh, problems with biocontrols uh, probably during the, I would say, last 10 years, 15 years or so, when that big project was uh, implemented in the, uh, in the Gulf by Owada, I guess. But we cannot claim, we cannot continue, uh, you know, repeating the same thing, you know, oh, it failed. No, but the technologies have changed. I mean, the science has, has, has really, uh, you know, has been developed. Now there are excellent formulations. There are, we don't, we don't do business as usual. We don't do business the way we did it uh, years ago. So I believe, I don't think we should really close the door for science because that's, that to me, that would be wrong. Uh, we should give, uh, uh, in fact, uh, Dr. Felero knows and some of the colleagues uh, know, we did put together a, a big proposal, uh, several experts on biological control uh, led by ICARDA and uh, to this FAO initiative, uh, still pending because the, the funding is uh, an issue. They did not get uh, you know, much really to cover all the different technical groups and the different proposals. But I think, uh, in my opinion, I don't think we should you know, just say, well, no, don't do this, don't do that. Uh, let me just give you, I mean, I don't know how to, whether the time allows. I was in Central Asia one time, and then uh, I talked to an entomologist in uh, Kazakhstan, and he told me, he gave me a gift, and that was a book on insect entomology. That was about probably 10 years ago. And then he said, Mustafa, what do you do? I said, well, among the things I work on is host plant resistance. He said, what are you dreaming? host plant is a genetic resistance for insect crops to resist to crops. Are you dreaming? Believe me, he stopped discussing with me. And people know we have released varieties carrying insect resistance in several crops, not only uh, us, Sikarda, but a lot of other organizations. So all what I'm saying should never, never, ne never close the door for, a, for an option, a management option and say, no, it does not work. And, halas, and that, that's, that's really wrong. So for instance, the example of host plant resistance, Dr. Filero went to, uh, to that, of course, should be given a chance. I'm sure host plant resistance with the huge diversity in of the, I'm sure there, there must be resistance out there that we should really attack it, uh, scientifically. Also, uh, landscape management, uh, should not have only, I mean, I, I sometimes I really feel frustrated when I go to a farm, a date palm farm, and it's very clean. That's very wrong. That's not good. Does not help with the natural enemies. You have to have allow some landscape, some other crops, etc., so that you have flowers for the natural enemies. Otherwise, you cannot conserve beneficial insects. You cannot have by control working. I, I'm, I'm, I'm usually against this must rearing of predator parasitoid, I don't favor that, but I do favor landscape ecology, landscape management, having diversity in the cropping system so that you favor uh, uh, natural enemies. And with this, I'd like to stop and thank you again, Dr. Zay, for the support. Thank you. Uh, thanks, of course, to the uh, Khalifa Award. And of course, uh, by the way, I'm still with the card until uh, probably December of this year, and then I retire, inshallah. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Miss Sarah. Thank you so much, Dr. Bohseni. Uh, and now we can um, if we can allow Dr. Walid Kaka. Uh, the floor is yours. Dr. Walid. Hello, Assalamu alaikum. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hello. Uh, hello, Dr. Valero. Uh, 
it's really a nice, uh, nice presentation. It's educational one. Uh, I just uh, want to have uh, two comments. Uh, one related to the um, the pheromone traps, the number of pheromone traps per hectare. Um, in in the UAE, we use actually uh, two uh, traps per hectare, as as far as mass trapping. Um, I believe it's. Uh, if you are going to consider it uh, for monitoring or for mass trapping, for monitoring probably one or two uh, traps per hectare probably was going to be enough for monitoring. But for mass trapping, uh, many programs, they do not really follow the, uh, the, the correct number. The correct number should be at least four or five traps per hectare. I know it's... Um, it's a labor consuming because you, you are going to use more laborers to, um, to monitor or to, uh, to inspect the traps on a weekly basis. That's if you are going to use um, uh, traditional traps, the one which you are going to add water and food on a, on a weekly basis to inspect it, the maintenance. It's a weekly inspection during the summertime, probably it's a bi-weekly, uh, probably during the winter time. But I believe that one trap per hectare for monitoring probably is going to be ac acceptable. But for mass trapping, you we need more than that. In the UAE, we use two. And uh, in, in certain areas, really, we need uh, really three or four minimum uh, per hectare. Uh, maintenance is really the main components of the pheromone systems. If there is no maintenance, if, if you are going to only maintain the traps on a monthly basis, we are going to really lose uh, an, an, an many um, adults or catching will be really uh, reduced. Um, the second uh, comment related to the um, detection tools. Uh, for me, I have evaluated the many uh, tools and the best one as far as the pheromone traps it's really the Electrop. I have evaluated that in 2015 and uh, in the last five years. Uh, can, in the last five years, uh, I have evaluated the Electrop many times. And I think, I believe I, I'm the first one who evaluated the Electrops in the UAE. And uh, we used it uh, for four months. We haven't really added uh, any, uh, of course, it's a dry trap. And uh, really, we, we went there on a monthly basis just to check uh, the, the catch. But it's really a very good tool. But again, I agree with you 100%. Visual observations is the best for me. So you, we can really combine the visual observations plus the dry traps will be uh, really good to catch the red palm weevil adults. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Walid. Um, and now we would like to um, invite uh, Dr. Michel, if you could hear us. Dr. Michel. I think there's something wrong with the sound uh, with Dr. Michel because we cannot hear you. Um, and now we can welcome uh, any more questions. So, okay. Um, I would like again to remind uh, all the Arnabel uh, participants to provide us with your contact details so we can update you with all the awards news or further information on the awards categories or participation in the International Library. So please, uh, it would be much appreciated if we can have your full name, email, and phone number uh, in the chat uh, down here. Um, and also we would like to thank you so much for your attendance today. And we are looking forward to meeting you again on the 8th of November in the second session of the awards target categories for potential candidates. So we're looking forward to, uh, on seeing you again on the 8th, as we said, which will be Sunday, 8 p.m., um, 8th of November. 
Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Valerio, for Thank your you, valuable uh, lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abdulhab Zaid. Thanks to all the honorable attendees and participants. Um, wishing you a great night and looking forward to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.